Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to um, commend the organisers of this uh, symposium for including music as part of the scope of the discussion today. As Jared Vaughan said uh, in his opening address, music was an integral part of Versailles and the construction of identity and the lived experience uh, of Versailles. And my uh, discussion today, it's more, more of a discussion than an actual paper uh, because I, it's uh, the provocation of this symposium really caused me to think through this notion of living Versailles. Uh, apart from the way that we normally uh, experience uh, particularly music or the architectural space in a contemporary way. So one of the sort of first questions that I uh, was asked myself was how do we approach an understanding of Versailles in an age of disembodied and mediated experiences? And I think this is even more difficult when these disembodied experiences actually form part of the contemporary being of Versailles. So for many of the majority of people who have never been to Versailles, things such as the TV series, as we heard, is there perhaps only knowledge of Versailles, a recreated, disembodied, mediated experience? Uh, it even goes so far as video games, uh, where you can experience daily life in Versailles as a disembodied uh, player through atavars, etc., in a game environment. Or, for example, my, my Apple Music, where I can summon Monsieur Lully uh, at my will, and I can have his music without his presence here some uh, few centuries later. And whilst we can situate bodies in spaces, this in itself, uh, this image in particular, is more about a contemporary consumption of Versailles as an experience. If we actually manage to situate bodies in spaces uh, that may or may not speculatively have uh, been used in the production of music, this can aid in musicological and performative studies, but it still doesn't address the issue about the context, the lived context of musical production and reception within the spaces of Versailles. And whilst we may be able to get a deeper understanding of performance practices of the time in the actual spaces, what I'd like to do today is thinking about how we can situate this out of the museum. So this image here of Les Arts Florissants, uh, although it's very uh, appealing, is a contemporary image of a contemporary musical practice, in essence, in, as a museum. But in the interest of today, how can we situate this back into the palace? We heard uh, from the speakers in the first session about the actual reality of Versailles and what it meant to construct palaces in the early modern period. And we need to remember that Versailles, for the majority of its life, was a, a space in flux, a series of spaces in flux, in constant construction. And in trying to identify how the production of music and the performance and reception of music operated within this architectural context, we need to understand that it shifted. So just as music types evolved, uh, so too did the architectural space. And we have a fusion where architecture and music uh, fused to uh, form new types that Versailles innovated. And of course, the question is, which Versailles are we talking about? So in all these iterations of Versailles, music was present, music was performed, music was consumed. And of course, whose Versailles? That the Versailles of the king was very different to the Versailles of a minor courtesan. But uh, all these people enjoyed music in some form in different spaces. As I'm sure we're all well aware, uh, Louis XIV, in his conception of himself and of the uh, Versailles complex, saw music and architecture, as we can see in this image. Sort of, uh, Music up there is represented with instruments, the musette, uh, other things, but also architecture is represented there under his protectorage. So within the formation of his identity as a ruler and also how that was embodied within the palace and the palace protocol and ritual, music and architecture were integral to that. So in organising our thoughts around uh, architecture and music production at Versailles, we need to think about the rhetorical significance of music, not only to uh, the kings of France, but also in the way that the space was coded. 
we need to think about how this then worked with protocol, and within protocol I, I uh, would like to include etiquette and also ritual. So I think in terms of Versailles, we can't separate the performance of music and the architectural space without thinking about those, which is why we have the architectural and the sonic as components of the protocol and ritual framework. One of the most important things that uh, I believe governed the way in which uh, music spaces were formed within Versailles is the notion of spatial scarcity and spatial flux. Two very important things that we can't forget, which is why I've re-shown that um, image there. And I'll revisit this detail from the, the uh, Almanac of 1669, but immediately you can see the presence of body, the, the numerous presence of bodies in a very limited space, and a space that was constantly changing. What is also important, and we can't forget the, the human experiential nature, is that apart from protocol uh, and etiquette, people enjoyed music. People loved dancing to music. People, irrespective of their status and rank within the world, enjoyed music production and music consumption. I think that we, we need not to forget that besides all the wigs and all the gowns and all the high heels, there were people who loved music and it was an integral part of their experience. So if we have a look at these four elements that were uh, at play and I'd say that there is this constant tension between these four things that at different times and different moments within the life of Versailles uh, either throughout its period or in a particular uh, calendar sense we're pulling each other in different directions competing and conflicting uh, with some taking greater precedence than others. And at the centre of this, particularly at the beginning, was Louis, Louis XIV and his vision of what uh, a completed, constructed environment was. As we heard from, from, from Wolf this morning, the ambassador's staircase was not just a piece of architecture, uh, not just a series of paintings, but actually a performative space that included music, sound and movement. Uh, returning back to the almanac uh, here, you could actually see this uh, represented with uh, the, the king and queen on axis. We also know about the uh, desire for symmetry and balance, the members of the immediate family here, the other rank of uh, aristocrats filed in orders, the musicians crammed up in galleries and those others, so sort of these poor other people who were not so important get shoved uh, at the back as a clear representation of spatial scarcity uh, deployed there, you can see there. So if we have a look at uh, the orbits of circle and how uh, architecture mediated this, of course we have the king, uh, we then have the immediate members of the family, uh, the favourites, uh, an image there, uh, the princes of the blood, we then have other ranks of aristocracy, and then, I couldn't fit this on the screen, obviously, we then have the, the non-aristocracy uh, forming the majority of, of the universe in an absolutist uh, world. And particularly at Versailles, spatial proximity to the king was currency. Therefore, particularly in a palace that was under construction for many years, space and its allocation became a currency. So who had the biggest apartment, who had the apartment closest to the king, whose body was closest to the king for the most amount of time became your currency at court. Uh, here's an image here uh, from Blondel of uh, some apartments at Versailles, and I'm sure that somebody here more knowledgeable can tell us, uh, I'm sure, about all the fights that went on about the allocation of who got which apartment when somebody died or was disgraced. And all of this was mediated by architectural space. So hierarchy was embodied within the actual allocation, the per square metre allocation and proximity through architectural space. One of the issues that the, the bodily presence of people as musicians, who were, of course, all uh, commoners, was that they could cut through these ranks, they could cut through the spatial uh, proximity and gain access to the most intimate physical environments of the king and the royal family on a daily basis. Now, I think that's one of the differences between, say, a painter who may have the occasional meeting with the king or the council. A musician was in the king's presence day in, day out, 
and multiple times of day. And this afforded a very, very interesting, um, uh, let's say, disruption to the hierarchical norms. But within that, it also posed very, very large spatial problems in terms of architectural and protocol decorum of what do you do with these common bodies that are so intimate within royal space. And that's something I'll be looking at. So the way I've div uh, divided it and why I've titled my uh, presentation today is that we can see that within the conception of music in, in particularly the, the early modern uh, court world, the rhetorical and the experiential aspects I've labelled the heavenly voices. So that either um, have some type of symbolic importance and are seen as good and important or are enjoyed and are hence a pleasant thing versus the, uh, let's say, the unfortunate uh, earthly corporeal reality of musicians with large instruments occupying lots of space. And as we heard this morning um, from Gerard, uh, it was the largest court uh, musician hire ship in Europe and they all needed space uh, in this palace where everybody was fighting for space. So music was an essential component to the symbolic, political, rhetorical and experiential conception of Versailles. The embodied nature of musical production occupied scarce space that could be given over to aristocrats or could be given over to somebody who could pay for that space to gain access. And the embodied nature of musical production brought non-aristocratic people close to the royal person or his inner circles. So we have conflicting issues of protocol and spatial proximity. So the people, the important people, want the music as close as possible to them so that they can hear it and enjoy it more. But then this poses problems. There are also problems with best practice musical performance and architectural decorum because if the musicians are closer, how do the designers accommodate these hundreds of musicians in uh, tight spaces. So the first example I'd like to look at is the Royal Chapel. Uh, this is the, uh, the chapel from 19, uh, sorry, 1682, which really served the majority of the time of Louis XIV's experience at Versailles. He used it for 28 years. And of, it was never really happy with its size. It really didn't suit the decorum of what a king of Louis' stature should be. And there were numerous plans to move the chapel uh, and to rebuild it, but there are um, lots and lots of issues, primarily money, uh, got in the way. And he, this uh, painting is in the exhibition. So the musician's gallery, uh, one would assume, is actually here where the, um, the picture has been painted uh, from. And this is a cut through the chapel at Fontainebleau. And as you can see in this example, space was an issue. Where do we put things such as organs and orchestras that are essential for the decorum of a royal liturgy? And Louis was not satisfied with having a very, very small, uh, tiny, portative organ and a few, few strings when what he wanted was the grandest uh, court chapel in the world. In 1679, Louis XIV ordered a double organ. This is a double uh, organ. It has the Grand Orgue, which is the large, uh, the large uh, instrument there, and the uh, positif, which normally sits on the balcony of the tribune. And this was ordered from Etienne Enoch, but it remained in the workshop. So it was ordered in 1679 and never was built. So perhaps this was for the 1679 design of the chapel, which was eventually abandoned. And this tells us that the position of the organ within that chapel design would have been a different arrangement to the one in which the royal chapel is, which we could see here. And so this is the idea of what Louis wanted for his uh, chapel and the royal events that happened within it. So let's have a look at that diagram uh, in relation to this. So the idea of the final chapel came, uh, it is said, came from Benini's plan for the chapel at the Louvre, in which the musician's tribune, uh, which is situated there, is directly opposite on the first floor of the king's tribune. And what this does, it allows the musicians to be over here without interrupting or being close to the king, and the king can hear the music at that level best. If the musicians were up here and the king was down here, the music wouldn't hear, sound as good, and if the musicians were down here, uh, the king would not be able to hear it as well. But this meant that the organ had to be changed because it's such a large instrument, they couldn't have the, the positif hanging over the high altar. 
And already the organ poses large architectural and uh, I guess we'd call it liturgical uh, decorum issues about having the organ more prominent than the high altar in the chapel. But I think this is interesting, as the king must have signed off on this design, about the importance of the king's enjoyment of music within the daily mass. So let's have a quick listen to uh, the organ in the chapel royal. <laughs> interesting story of Louis Marchand, who was organist at Versailles, got into a fight with Louis XIV um, over his wife getting half his pay and shut the organ halfway through the Mass. And when the king asked, why did you um, not finish the Mass, Louis uh, Marchand supposedly said, seeing as you pay my wife half my wage, she can play half the Mass. Uh, I can't find any evidence to that, but it is a well-known documented uh, uh, anecdote within the music world. And within that, if you think about where Louis would be standing at the centre of the King's Gallery, he can look across and see David playing the, the harp or the lyre, which also refers back to Apollo uh, there in the imagery. And here's the issue, what I, what I was speaking before about the, the, the issue about decorum in which uh, the organ takes precedence over the altar. Uh, it's one of the few examples in France. The only other example I can think about is in the... In the uh, Carthusian Charter House in Toulouse uh, for an, a similar example. In the daily operation of the liturgy within the chapel, there was lots and lots of careful thought about the positions, the adequate positions of, of musicians for the effective and correct performance of the music. And we can see an example here, uh, which shows a normal uh, low mass being performed in the chapel. However, there were the extraordinary events uh, such as this one, in which it put the chapel into extraordinary spatial uh, and, and ritual mode. We can see the example here uh, from the wedding of, of uh, the Dauphin and Marie Antoinette, and there are the musicians there. So the musicians are crammed in. You could see that the space has been given over to aristocrats who had, you had to be there at the wedding. This is the event of the year, the event of the decade. You needed to be there. So because of this spatial scarcity, the musicians and their performance ability are crammed. And I would actually argue that on these days, I think the music would have been poorer than uh, on a normal uh, event. There were more bodies in the space. There was lots and lots of chatter, and the musicians were crammed. Let's have a listen to a Tadeum, uh, which may have been sort of performed around the time. Here's another example of an, of an extraordinary uh, event. Um, you can see the musicians here in the galleries. We have uh, what is believed to be Lully uh, directing the musicians, which is a very, very difficult task. So if we go back to this image here, the construction of this uh, ephemeral pavilion, trying to coordinate all these different musicians and this prince in the exhibition as well, and if you have a look at all the faces of all the people in there, they're all talking to each other, which I'm not quite sure if it's just so you don't get backs of heads in the representation or if this was a reality. But it would have been very difficult as a musician to try to perform under these uh, circumstances. So I would argue that in many ways the, the conception, the symbolic conception, uh, overrided necessarily the quality of the, the musical performance at these extraordinary uh, events. Another example here of Ludi's Alceste being performed in front of the, uh, the marble court. And these, the distances here, as you know, is very, very, very large. And how one side of musicians keep uh, in touch with another side so that the king doesn't have his view interrupted is an example here of protocol overtaking uh, best practice musical 
performance. It would have been very, very difficult for that to have happened. This is an example here uh, in the Royal Stables for the, um, the celebration of, of the wedding, in which you can see also uh, how crammed everybody is. This is probably um, Rameau there conducting the Princess of uh, Navarre, which I'll play a little bit. <laughs> So I'll just move on uh, very, very quickly just to finalise. So these issues were present throughout all of Versailles of how to accommodate musician bodies. This is the example in the Salle de Mar of the Musicians' Tribune, which was demolished in 1750 uh, through the changing practices of the, uh, the amusement. This is in the Salle de Pallon. In the Trianon as well, where we have the musicians' galleries there so that they were, could be heard but not seen, the opposite of children. I'll move very quickly um, on through uh, just to the end of the presentation. As we move through the 18th century, we can see that this concern for etiquette and formality diminishes within, within court. And one of the issues is that we don't really know uh, whether this existed in previous reigns, but it was actually documented in later ones, so that we could see the presence of musicians, possibly there might actually be aristocrats who play instruments within the presence of Marie Antoinette, the informal settings of the, um, the apartment of the Mesdames, where musicians gathered and performed Mozart, Tapre, all performed in these uh, apartments for Madame Victoire and Adelaide. Um, the, the, the picture that's in the Prince de Conti there with a, a lady playing the harpsichord uh, whilst having her dinner on top and another gentleman playing uh, the harp. So we could see that the musicians weren't always separated in a formal barrier sense from uh, the aristocrats enjoying the performance. And just to finish, I wanted to have a look at these two pictures in which we have the, uh, the, the Souche family there depicted with their musical instruments and a group of musicians depicted as a family. That I want to come back to the fact that despite all the constraints of protocol, and etiquette, the enjoyment and production of music was a common human experience that united classes within the lived Versailles. Thank you.